Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. Our topic focuses on making small changes to your office design that can make a big difference. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator. There will be no live Q&A following today's presentation. If you have additional questions about this topic that cannot be answered by today's presentation, please feel free to email webinars at henryshine.com or Dr. Tholen. This webinar is sponsored by Henry Schein Dental and no CE credits are being offered for viewing this presentation. I am excited to welcome back Dr. Mark Tholen as our speaker today. Dr. Tholen has lectured extensively all over the world and is the author of three dental textbooks. His career in dentistry spans over 30 years, including clinical practice before obtaining his MBA. Thank you, Dr. Tholen, for your presentation today. Take it away. Well, thank you very much, Adam. We appreciate it. And uh, I'm just really happy to be here again uh, with all of you and uh, in another uh, Henry Schein dental webinar. And uh, today we're going to be talking about how we can reinvent our practices and how we can do that in a very, very short period of time, uh, almost a, a week, uh, if, uh, if everybody does what they need to do in a uh, during that time. And we're, we're going to be talking about um, uh, an office facelift without making any big changes. And in fact, we're not going to be moving any walls at all. Okay? This is a purely uh, cosmetic change. And, um, and we will make some uh, suggested productivity changes also. But essentially, uh, this is something that we can do to make our office feel brand new uh, to us and to our staff as well as to our patients. And hopefully it's also going to improve the productivity in your office uh, because your patients are going to have a very different attitude about your practice because of the way it appears. So let's go ahead and, uh, and get started with this. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is born out of reality. I mean, we've, uh, we, we've designed over 3,000 offices in the United States and Canada. And um, in, in doing that, we always track productivity of the offices after we've actually designed them and after the doctor's actually working in there. And because we always are interested in being able to enhance productivity and to also reduce the stress of the staff in the in the office at the same time and so uh, nothing here is theoretical it's uh, it, it's not um, uh, just something out of my head it's something that we have uh, worked on for decades and we have a very very defined and reliable formula for success so with that um, I'll say that, that uh, uh, everything you're going to hear about here is, uh, is a result of my architectural team and myself uh, working and uh, collecting data. And all that data has been used to come up with very specific steps of how to uh, enhance productivity in an office. But before we get into the actual steps of what it takes to change an office, let's, um, I'm gonna ask you a very, very uh, simple but important question. And that is, does design really make a difference? I mean, it's really important that, um, that we all embrace this idea uh, so that we have some level of commitment that indeed we're gonna make some changes in our offices. And I, I think most of us would probably say, yeah, design does make a difference in a dental office and the way the patients react to us uh, when, uh, when they walk in, especially the brand new patient. Um, but, uh, I, you know, but I'm, I'm not really committed to making any real changes in my facility. So let's see what we can do to, um, to convince you that indeed these changes are essential. Uh, here's an office in Tennessee. I mean, it's, it's obviously um, rather plain and, um, you know, it, it's uh, long and narrow, you know, kind of a bowling alley, kind of maybe a double wide uh, office in a, uh, a double wide trailer. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, nobody's going to expect to receive a male clinic level of care in an office like that. But what about an office like this? A very different uh, facility, uh, very, very elegant, 
uh, very uh, well thought out. Uh, it really it makes a statement. Now, where would you rather go if you were a dental patient for full mouth reconstruction? Where would you go if you had a serious dental problem and you recognized you needed someone who really knew uh, their onions, so to speak? Well, it's the same doctor, okay? It's the same doctor in Tennessee. The same doctor moved from the office you see in the corner to the office you see on the main screen. He underwent a metamorphosis and the metamorphosis was recognition that if he wants to have a certain type of patient, he needs to look the part and he needs to sound the part in order to, to get the chance to be the part. Here's a doctor in Colorado. Uh, he's in a strip center, an old strip center. Uh, there's a insurance agency on one side and a sandwich shop on the other. And look at the condition of the parking lot. Rather sad. Is this where you're going to go for a, uh, again, full mouth reconstruction? Is this is where you're going to go for the, uh, the end though? on uh, that Maxley Wright first molder? Uh, is this, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think so. However, you would go to this office for some serious dental care. It's the same doctor again. The doctors underwent a complete change because they understood their image was important, that the image in the mind of the patient is their skill set. Here's the average waiting room. The average waiting room has, look at this, this particular office. It has a, uh, it is a stained carpet. It's got some uh, chairs in here that look like they come from um, uh, Walmart, and they're about $89 to $99 a piece. We've got a, an occasional table there that is a plastic veneer, you know, antique plastic veneer. Uh, no, th this is not making any kind of statement of quality. Let's improve uh, ourselves and let's put our best foot forward. Here is what we don't want on the left. We don't want dark. We don't want narrow. We don't want scary, okay? We, we want is an open and illuminated space, as you see on the right, okay? This space says, come on in, nothing bad happens here. If you'll notice the illumination uh, allows the, pay, okay, illumination invites a patient into a space, okay? Darkness says, stay out, it's scary. So what we wanna do is to be able to have our patients feel not only welcome, but safe. And illumination does that. Almost everything we take in today is done visually. A very little bit is done auditorily anymore. I mean, we are a society in which our, our, um, all of our information is taken in with what we see. And in fact, I mean, even this program, of course, right? I mean, you're, you're watching and listening to this program, but the vast majority of information that you're gleaning is done visually. And so we need to communicate with our patients visually rather than auditorily. And, uh, you know, we, we don't need to deliver a monologue to our patients. We need to show them who we are by our physical plant and by the appearance of our staff and ourselves. So there is a very defined formula for practice success, and I'm gonna share that with you now. And this formula has been developed over the last two plus decades of uh, my team and I working together with thousands of practices across America, and this formula works. It works for every practice. It works for a specialty practice. It works for a general practice. Um, it works for um, uh, it, it practices in socioeconomically depressed areas. It works for practices on Rodeo Drive in Los Angeles or on the Miracle Mile in Chicago. 
It works with uh, single doctor practices. It works with multi-doctor practices. So this always works. And first of all, we have to have an office that has great functionality. And by that, I mean, uh, from an architectural standpoint, that means we want to uh, optimize productivity and we want to minimize stress. Okay? So we're going to address that to some degree with, uh, with the um, uh, suggestions I'm going to have for you today in how to uh, reinvent your office in a week. Uh, but we're mostly going to function, uh, uh, focus on image, okay? Image is, uh, image in, in many ways is everything. Um, I'm gonna use a metaphor here. Uh, if you are delivering a, a uh, Buick Regal level of care, your office should actually be that Buick Regal. If you're delivering a, um, a Kia Soul, level of care, your office should be that Kia Soul. If you're delivering a Mercedes-Benz S550 level of care, your office should be that Mercedes-Benz S550. So we need to match the, the uh, image to the level of care we're providing or, or proposing to our patients. It's critical. And then we're going to take uh, some money. We're going to put it toward the functionality of our office and toward the image of our office, and it's going to yield a level of success. Okay. Now, um, I purposely uh, wrote a, a big F here with a dollar sign and a small I. Okay. The most of the dollars required to do this are in the infrastructure of the office, and relatively few dollars are dedicated toward the image. And that's what I'm talking about. Okay? Where I'm talking about using this smaller dollar amount, the image. Okay? So we're going to take the image component of this, of this formula and we're going to use it to incrementally improve our practices and our productivity and also just give our practices a, um, a fresh look. Uh, again, we're reinventing the practice with um, some minor changes that make a major impact on our, on our patient base. So here's how we're gonna be successful. When our office environment is consistent and congruent with the level of, of uh, treatment we're proposing to our patients, we will be successful. And that's critical. So what I'm talking about is having a, uh, an image that is consistent and congruent with the care that you're proposing to your patients. And in case you didn't get the message, <laughs> this is not consistent nor congruent, okay? Uh, we're not gonna put a limo in front of a trailer. Okay? That, uh, what, it, that, that doesn't work, does it? Okay, so consistency is key. So how do we actually go about rejuvenating or reinventing our practice? Well, there are three elements to it. One is, is uh, furniture and finishes. How can we change? How can we amend? How can we upgrade our furniture and our finishes? In other words, the uh, wall coverings or uh, painting on our wall, uh, the, uh, the carpet, and, um, and um, other accessories, like pictures on the wall, uh, that, that type of thing. Uh, also, purposeful lighting, and purposeful, purposeful and intentional lighting. In other words, lighting that is accomplishing a very specific uh, task for us. Uh, perhaps it's going to be illuminating the technology in our office. Uh, perhaps it's illuminating very specific things we want the patient's eye to go to. So we're going to be talking about lighting today. We're going to be talking about furniture and finishes today. And then we'll be talking about, uh, well, I, my only comment about equipment and technology, we're really not going to address that today. I'm just going to say that if, uh, if you're interested in upgrading your equipment and technology, and especially the technology, because your younger patient base is gonna be very, very critical of the types of technology that you're using. And they're gonna be looking to see how digital the office is. 
And I, I would just say at, at this point, uh, most of us, uh, if not all of us, should just about be totally digital. So with that, let's begin. Uh, with furniture and finishes, uh, we're going to spend probably somewhere between twenty and twenty-five thousand dollars in the average five to six op office to change out the furniture and the finishes, at least in the waiting room and the front desk, and um, in, in all the areas that the public actually sees. Uh, then with the with lighting. Uh, you're going to spend probably around uh, $9 a square foot to, um, to reinvent your lighting. And, and so you can add that up. I mean, maybe you don't, maybe you don't uh, revise the lighting in the entire office, but uh, you, you revise it in uh, specific areas. So I, that's why I broke it down into uh, cost per square foot. And I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to discuss what you would be doing in those uh, arenas, and I'm going to discuss how to do it also today. So we've heard about how much it's going to cost. Now let's see what we're actually going to do. Okay. So let's be talking about uh, furniture and finishes uh, just to begin with. Well, here we have an image of an office, of a waiting room in an office, and you can see that with this particular uh, waiting room, Okay, the, the, the uh, a statement is being made, okay? And, and the statement is one of quality. The statement is one of order. It's one of being in control that, uh, th that this office um, is delivering a high level of care in a very precise way. And so you know, look at the lighting in here. I mean, it's, it's very elegant lighting. The furniture is very nice. Everything's very orderly. And, uh, and the finishes uh, are, are varied, but they're elegant. Now, becoming a little bit more specific, you now this very general thing, uh, here we have, uh, look at the chairs in this particular waiting room. Okay? Now, the, we want the, wait, the chairs in the waiting room to have commercial grade material. You don't want contract grade material. You don't want residential grade. You want commercial grade material. They will last the longest. And many times we're gonna have these chairs custom designed, custom made, because they're going to last for 15 to 17 years that way. And every time a patient sits in them, they're going to make a statement. Uh, notice also the, um, the banding on the walls here. Uh, and when I say banding, there is a small white um, band at the top of the wall, uh, just above the pictures. And uh, you can see that banding, it, it uh, just breaks up the wall somewhat. And then we've got wall covering below that. Notice the lighting, how, um, how intentional and purposeful the lighting is over the lights, uh, over the, um, over the uh, uh, pictures there. And notice the carpet in this waiting room. The carpet is a medical grade carpet, and I'll be talking about that uh, on a, uh, uh, specifically in just a few moments. Here is a waiting room. It's very simple. But uh, what we did to change this waiting room and make it, it now it has a rather dramatic statement, is uh, several things. Uh, first of all, the windows. The windows were very simple rectangles. Now the windows have been extended with a transom. And that is the area above what you would call the conventional rectangular window. And we've also uh, used wood frames. Wood frames give a real sense of quality. And so this is a little bit more extensive uh, facelift, but, uh, but nonetheless, we're not moving any walls at all. And um, notice the banding again uh, to break up the wall and, uh, and also the lighting, a okay? very nice lighting that's uh, illuminating the uh, space rather nicely. There's down lighting, and then we put in a coffer there. Okay, that's just a little false um, uh, device that's designed to uh, house a light in a trough, so there's up lighting. 
So the coffer in the ceiling with the up lighting going to the ceiling, then the down lighting, and then the furniture, okay? It, it's nice, okay? It's going to make a statement every time the patient uh, sits in it, a statement of quality, okay? That you're, you're framing the patient's expectation, okay? A good thing is going to happen here. We are very precise. And uh, I mean, what is dentistry? If it's not elegant, it's not a science, it's not precision, okay? It's all of those things. And so we want an office that's consistent with that. And again, we have medical grade carpet on the floor here. Now, here is a, uh, a waiting room that has a very specific theme to it. Okay? It's actually a very small waiting room and, um, and it's very, very simple actually. I mean, it, it has painted walls. There's no wall covering in here. And, uh, but, but notice, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's elegant. Um, it has a pendant light. Uh, the pendant light is, um, is offering some variation in the room. And, um, and we're also using butternut walls. And I'm just gonna suggest that, that uh, the, the color butternut produces a great result and it allows uh, a very rich feeling in, uh, in the waiting room. And a, a comment about uh, pictures. Okay. We can have $5 or $10 prints, and, but we want it in a $250 frame. Okay. Nobody's an art critic in your, in your, uh, among your patients, but everybody knows what a good frame looks like. For heaven's sakes, be sure that even the uh, cheap prints are placed in expensive frames. And indeed, uh, our, my design team does that. Uh, the interior designers will, will uh, they, they have big, big books with thousands of, of um, pictures or paintings in them. And uh, you can select any type of print and, and then, uh, then it's framed. But when we frame it, that's where we pay attention okay, uh, to, to uh, the elegance and the detail because everybody can critique a frame. Here is a, um, here, here's a, a coffee bar in an office. So you might want to consider if you have room for one to place a refreshment center or a coffee bar in your um, in your waiting room, and uh, and again we have a uh, a picture. It is uh, again a simple little print, but it's elegantly framed, and also um, it has very purposeful lighting. Now, I'm going to suggest if you have room in your office, for heaven's sakes be sure you have a consult room, a consultation room, okay? Because it will almost double your case acceptance. And if you have a consult room that is uh, consistent and congruent with the level of care you're proposing to your patients, that, that's the key, that's the key. And a, a couple of other pieces and parts to that is that it should be at least, um, um, uh, nine by nine uh, and to be in at least have an eight foot ceiling uh, to be psychologically effective and to uh, to effect a very specific result uh, or, or a response from the patient which is going to be uh, okay yes I, I please let's let's go ahead and, and do that let's go ahead and, and uh, perform that care So here is a, uh, some comments about uh, carpet in an office. I'm gonna suggest a, a uh, medical grade carpet and a medical grade carpet, uh, and that's exactly what you ask uh, the interior designer for, medical grade carpet, please, in my office, okay? It will not stain. A period. I don't care what's dropped on it. I don't care if an assistant drops a uh, container of uh, sodium hypochlorite uh, on, on the carpet, you know, bleach. It, it, it's not gonna stain. It's amazing. And it's because it is solution dyed. In other words, 
when the uh, nylon that is going to be used to make the um, uh, to make the carpet is actually being spun and it's in the nylon is actually in its liquid form a solution of dye is uh, is applied to the uh, the liquid nylon and so it is a solution dyed carpet okay? it's a solution dyed nylon uh, fiber and we want to have a 26 to 30 ounce face weight and you want the uh, and you want the uh, carpet to have a looped and not a tufted design, because uh, a tufted design will crush and and uh, it will look bad within a few months. But looped design will look good for 15 years. Okay? We've had we've had uh, offices and clients who have said, you know what, the carpet still looks fantastic, but uh, it's been 12 years, it's been 14 years, we're sick of it, and we just like to have a new carpet. We're gonna, we're gonna put a new one in. So again, medical grade carpet uh, will also really reduce the level of noise in your office, okay? Uh, because the uh, sound will be uh, somewhat attenuated with the carpet. So how do we actually how do we actually accomplish this? How do we actually go about uh, doing this uh, uh, transformation, this metamorphosis? How do we go about reinventing the the office? I'm going to suggest you hire an interior designer or you hire a, a, an architect. Uh, but if if you're going to um, uh, hire an interior designer, I would get a, a suggestion from uh, your, your shine representative, uh, your, your, either your equipment uh, specialist or your uh, merchandise specialist. And, uh, and you want an interior designer who understands dental environments because dental environments are very harsh compared to almost every other type of commercial uh, space. I mean, they really are uh, beaten up and they're exposed to a lot of materials and, and, um, and liquids and solutions that uh, really assault uh, surfaces of, of uh, all of our uh, furnitures and finishes, uh, whether they're in the clinical area or they're in the public area. So we want a designer who, who uh, has worked in, uh, on, on dental projects before and who has long-term uh, results to show. Here's just an example of, a, of an office in an interior uh, lease space. Um, and this particular uh, designer uh, decided to use glass block uh, throughout the office. And you can see the glass block in the, uh, in the um, here in the, in the, in the photo. And, um, and then kind of the theme of the glass block is carried through on the door also, uh, entry door. And, and uh, when you look at this uh, paper mache casting to the left, it is actually the image and the, um, and the uh, symbol, uh, the logo of the office. So it's very, you know, a very innovative group of people, uh, interior designers, who can really help with a number of different issues besides just the design uh, uh, or the materials of the office. In this particular office, you can see the glass block is carried through on the uh, reception desk. And then uh, it's actually dividing the, uh, the consult room from the uh, trunk corridor uh, leading down into the, the clinical area. Now, an interior designer is not a decorator. Okay, a decorator in design, two different things. Uh, the image to the left is a result of an interior designer. Okay, decoration is what you see on the right. Okay, and you do not want a decorator. You want a degreed interior designer who has experience with dental offices and dental environments and the type of materials that are used in those dental environments. Now, how do you actually hire an interior designer um, I, I, or, or an architect? Uh, you want a fixed fee based on how many hours it's gonna take to provide the level of service 
that, that you're requesting. And so, um, and, and, and um, most of the time for what we're talking about is, uh, this is gonna be about 100 hours uh, to, to do what we're talking about here, okay? in terms of lighting and in terms of uh, furniture and finishes and actually getting those items to your office. Now, let's go ahead and just talk about lighting for, for a little bit. Um, with lighting, we want it to be intentionally and we want it to be purposeful. You can see in this, in this uh, uh, image on the right, it's intentional and purposeful. Okay, that light was put there for a very specific reason. It was to illuminate that uh, piece of art. And that's what I'm talking about, intentional and purposeful. Okay, we're not gonna just uh, create, uh, just stick lights throughout the office with no idea of why they're going, where they're going. Think of an art gallery, okay? An art gallery does not have lights just willy-nilly. They thought out where are the pieces of art going to be, what piece of art is going to be there, and what type of light will give the, um, will get, will, will, put the uh, piece of art in its best form. So we need a lighting plan, okay? And, uh, and so the, the um, interior designer or the architect is going to create a lighting plan. It's going to show where every fixture goes and what, what the fixture is. Now there will be a, there'll be a lighting schedule that goes along with that, nothing, it's, it's nothing more than a list, okay? A, a, a written list of, uh, with a key or a legend on it that, that uh, ties back to this lighting plan. And so uh, the, the um, electrician contractor will know exactly what is going where and, uh, and what type of bulb's gonna be in there, what the fixture is going to be, and exactly where it's placed. This you will probably not encounter with uh, this uh, simple uh, rejuvenation of the office. This is a reflected ceiling plan. Now, many times, and I'm just putting this in for completeness of the story, many times the, um, the uh, interior designer, the architect, will have to draw up the ceiling, though, first. They, they have to know what the ceiling looks like, and then, they, and then they lay in or layer in the lighting plan. So if the, uh, if the interior designer, the architect says, well, yeah, we can do the lighting plan, but we're gonna need to do a reflected ceiling plan first. I mean, th that's very logical and um, it's uh, generally necessary so that the electrician knows exactly where to put everything. So here is a, um, an example of a clinical uh, hallway and you can see the up lighting in the cathedral ceiling and uh, the down lighting that is being affected on those floating beams also. And uh, you can just see how elegant and beautiful all this really is uh, and how lighting can change a space. I mean, it, it's remarkable. You know, if you think of a, um, think of something like a, a Nordstrom's department store, uh, if you walk into the Nordstrom's, it's one great big box. However, uh, it's highly uh, delineated by different lights. Different lights in different sections give an entirely different feel to that portion of the, uh, of the, uh, of the store. And it's remarkable. And, uh, and they're using very specific lighting uh, both uh, accent lighting as well as ambient lighting to, to make a very, very specific statement. Now, what about lighting in the operatory? What we would like to see in the operatory is uh, a very specific ratio between the intensity of the operating light and the intensity of the ambient light. Okay? We want a 10 to one ratio between the intensity of the ambient light 
and the operating light. So if our operating light is working at 2,500 uh, foot candles, we would like the ambient light over the head of the chair to be at uh, 250 light candles. And the way we achieve that for the most part is having uh, four, um, four um, fluorescent bulbs in each fixture. So there are eight bulbs over the head of the chair right here. And, um, and we're using a prismatic lens, that is that corrugated plastic material, uh, prismatic lens uh, in the fixture. And that is giving us about 250 uh, foot candles over the head of the chair. And the reason we want to do this is to prevent eye fatigue for the clinician and for the assistant. Because, you know, when you start out the day, you don't have any eye fatigue, but by three or four in the afternoon, your eyes are really worn out. And you need to think about why that is. It's because the disparity between the intensity of the operating light that you're looking at. And then when you lift your eyes and you look into the operatory, my gosh, it's so much darker. Now your eyes have to work very hard to accommodate this change in illumination. And, you know, I mean, the, the, the pupil opens up because, holy, oh my gosh, you know, we don't have nearly as much light. And then when you look back into the oral cavity and the intense uh, operating light, now the, the pupils constrict again. And so by three or four in the afternoon, your eyes are very tired. So with this ratio, of a 10 to one uh, between the, uh, the ambient light and the, uh, and the operating light, why our eyes will not be fatigued at the end of the day. And if you want to have uh, accurate shades taken in your office, uh, you wanna use a color corrected index uh, in your fluorescent bulbs, a, a color corrected index of 90 or above. Again, this is another great reason why you want to have a, uh, an interior designer or an architect who's familiar with dental office design. Here's a, uh, an example of a clinical hallway, and this is just using uh, simple little sconces. If you'll notice the lights on, the, on every one of the rear delivery columns, uh, just adjacent to the actual operatories there, those four uh, sconces uh, produce a wonderful um, linear geometry, a colonnade effect. And that colonnade uh, is very pleasing uh, to the eye. And so we love to use these sconces and create a very elegant uh, statement of the environment, of the space in the, um, as the patient's walking down the clinical hallway. And again, we have medical grade carpet in the hallway here, if you'll notice. Now, here is a, uh, an example of an extremely simple lighting plan. And I put this in because it was so, so simple. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing more than uh, canned lights in the, um, in the laid in grid ceiling. Okay, this is a suspended ceiling. And so there are little cans that are moving all the way down the center of the clinical hallway. And then you see the spots, uh, spotlights that are illuminating and they're actually illuminating a, um, a, a logo, an image that you can't quite see on that rear delivery column. But the spots are not even recessed, okay? I mean, this is about as inexpensive a lighting plan as you could possibly get. And of course, when you have a laid in grid ceiling and you have space in the attic above it, uh, it really uh, makes things uh, even more inexpensive in terms of uh, adding light in the office. But, and, and now the last thing I'm gonna point out about this uh, particular image is notice the light pouring out of the operatories. There's light pouring out, then it's dark, then it's light, then it's dark. Light invites people into a space. Light says it's safe. Light says, come on in. So we want people, we want our patients to feel safe going into the operatory. And this indeed helps them, helps them uh, emotionally as they move into 
the uh, space of treatment. Now, this is how you actually ruin a, a, a perfectly good office, okay? I mean, instead of a purposeful and intentional lighting plan, there was no thought given to, to um, the lighting in this office, and they just decided to put some uh, almost uh, industrial warehouse type of illumination in the office. The office looks awful, you know? I mean, you... you um, is terrible. And the transformation this office could undergo with a good lighting plan would be um, unbelievable. You know what? Think of Starbucks. Okay? Starbucks is a great example of a place that effectively uses lights. Walk into Starbucks. Uh, it's a, the average Starbucks is about 1,500 square feet, and there are in uh, in general, there's somewhere between 100 and 120 lights on the ceiling. Think about that. 100 to 120 lights in 1,500 square feet. That is amazing. But Starbucks is creating a very specific experience for you in their, in their facilities. And, uh, and they know lighting plays a huge role in it. So I, you, you cannot overstate the, uh, the function and purpose and effect of lighting. So here's one example. Here is a, 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 you know, an old tired office, very, very dated. And all we did was change the, uh, the, and okay, admittedly, it's a little bit more of a change that I'm discussing right now, but we changed the front desk, okay? We changed the front desk from that to this. And uh, you can see with the, the pendant light and with the, um, the, the soffit that's over the reception desk now and the up and down lighting right there, uh, I mean, it, it just makes all the difference in the world. And instead of having a solid wall right there, uh, we put in a couple of windows. So yes, that, this is a little bit more of a, what I call radical change, but, um, how long does it take? Not long, because we're really not doing anything except removing one wall and adding some things. And then, and then yes, we, we, we punched out the, uh, the um, exterior wall uh, because it was not load bearing right there. And we were able to put in a glass uh, window. So it makes a huge difference. And um, so small changes here can make a big difference in the mind of your patients because the first thing they're going to see when they walk in is that front desk and your reception area. And if you put your best foot forward uh, in the beginning, they are very impressed. And uh, once they've made a decision about uh, the level of, of quality here, it's gonna take a lot of contradictory information to change their mind. So it's great time to set uh, the, the patient's attitude when they first walk in. Uh, a lot of the information that I've talked about today is available uh, in the two books that I've written, uh, one on, um, on uh, just almost exclusively floor plans, but the other one is a very comprehensive guide uh, to designing a, a dental or medical office and has much of what we discussed in it today. And they're available on amazon.com. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, just send them to me at uh, drmark at mynewdentaloffice.com. And that indeed is my website, mynewdentaloffice.com. And if you're interested in... Um, uh, if you're interested at all, take a look at some of the offices that we've done there, uh, listen to some of the doctors and their, um, their experiences, and if we can help you at all, be happy to do that. Otherwise, uh, be looking for a, uh, an interior designer uh, who has done uh, dental offices in the past. So with that, I thank you very much, and I wish you all the best in reinventing your office. Thank you, Dr. Tholen, for that great information. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. A link with today's recording will be sent out via email in the coming week. On behalf of Henry Schein, thank you, Dr. Tholen, once again. Enjoy the rest of the day.